Hey friends, I am so excited to share today's topic with you and just really give you more insight on what is soul fever, my own personal experiences with it, how to identify it in your own kids, and then what to actually do about it. But first, I wanted to say thank you so much for all of your love and support this past week with the launch of season two of the Streamline Motherhood podcast. Your kind words through DM, email, and in person mean everything to me, and it is the fuel that keeps this mama going. So please reach out anytime and let me know what you think, and leave me a review on iTunes if you're finding what I'm sharing valuable. Okay, friends, here we go. This is the Streamlined Motherhood Podcast. I'm Kate Saffel, Certified Simplicity Parenting Family Life Coach and Mom of Three. I'm here to guide you back to your intuition, to help you overcome daily overwhelm, and to start feeling confident in the mama and woman you are. Each episode, I'll share tips and encouragement for thriving on your motherhood journey, because this life you're living is way too important to put on autopilot. So have you ever been in that situation where you know that something isn't quite right with your child? They're not acting like themselves. They're out of sorts. Something has changed, and maybe you can't quite put your finger on it, but you know in your mama heart that there is something going on. I can tell you right now that not only have I been there in the past, that I'm currently there, and I'm dealing with it. And sometimes what seems like maybe a small temporary problem can grow into a really big one. And so, you know, I just want to, you know, connect with you here for a moment and say that if you are experiencing a major struggle with your child, I know what you're going through and it is so hard. And I hope that what I'm sharing today is at least some encouragement, um, whether that's in having some more strategies of what to do, or even just in knowing that you are not alone. So today I'm going to be sharing from a very personal perspective as well as a professional one. It is my hope that by opening up about my own experiences with my children, with what worked and what hasn't, as well as looking at just the big picture of childhood and when our children are functioning to their absolute best and when they are not, that maybe you and I can partner together going forward to help our kiddos overcome soul fever. Now, you may be wondering what soul fever even is. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a term that the author and child counselor Kim John Payne coined. He wrote the book Simplicity Parenting, and that's the method in which I'm certified. So as you can imagine, his teachings have played a pretty prominent role both in my home and in my coaching practice. Soul fever is the unrest and overwhelm a child experiences when their environment and days are out of alignment with their true needs. It's when a child is not quite themselves, and we may struggle to identify it or pinpoint it for some time because it's just not that obvious. Or it's possible that it's like a switch has been flipped and your child is just so very different and it is obvious to you that they are struggling and it's in this acute situation that we know that we have to act, we have to do something to help our child. So some of the signs that your child may have soul fever are lethargy or disinterest, clinginess, especially in young children, disconnection in older children, behavioral outbursts, or really anything that just seems out of character for your child. And I know you know your child so well, and you know when they are just not really being themselves. They may also have a desire to be home Um, like to skip school, skip activities, skip play dates, or you may see the flip and they're wanting to be out doing stuff all the time. They're, They're trying to distract from what's really going on in their heart, uh, in the home or in school. They may be emotionally volatile, like really just up and down and crying and angry and, you know, cycling through all of these different emotions. They may have trouble sleeping and eating or even using the bathroom or really 
any combination of the above of the list I just mentioned. No matter what, it is so hard to see your child struggling. We all want our children to be healthy, thriving, and happy. So what do you do if you see that, yes, your child does have soul fever? I'm going to help give you some answers here in just a moment. But first, I did want to just say a little disclaimer. A soul fever is a short-term condition. It's temporary. It doesn't last for months or years. A longer period of time may indicate that something more serious is going on, and definitely in that case, I suggest that you consult your doctor and a counselor or whatever team that you have in place for your child's wellness. As you'll see through my experiences parenting a child through this, we have gone through both of these routes, and I'll explain more here in just a moment. When your child has soul fever, you may be unsure of how to handle it. Often we can approach it similarly to how we would an actual illness. Sometimes this means extra cuddling, time at home and off from school, and a quiet, unstimulating environment might be all that is needed. That's the easy route, right? When we think about all the stimulation children experience today, the way in which the information of the adult world disturbs the innocence of their childhood, and the sheer busyness of the typical child's schedule, it's no wonder they experience soul fever. And let's be honest, we as adults experience soul fever. We go through our periods of just feeling disconnected and disinterested or lethargic. We're tired. We're overwhelmed. We're struggling. We're having all of those negative feelings. And sometimes we can really pinpoint what it is that's bothering us. You know, maybe it's we're out of alignment with our values and we're in a season of life that's really hard and it's really busy and We can't change it. And that difference between where we want to be and where we are can be so unsettling that it just triggers this season of soul fever in ourselves. Um, You know, often when we're in a bit of a funk ourselves, our children can pick up on that and that can trigger their own. A whole family can have soul fever. But here is the thing I want to say. There is no perfect childhood, no perfect home environment. There's no perfect mom. So let's scratch those unhelpful ideas before they take root. You, my friend, are doing the absolute best that you can. So together, let's talk about ways to help our children when they suffer from soul fever. One very practical way to help your child is to dial down the expectations and demands on him. This might look like stepping out of extracurriculars for a season, reducing the number of playdates and birthday parties, and maybe even being the one to drive your child to school and back, if you can, uh, for a little while instead of having them take the bus. The reason that we do this is we're increasing the connection points throughout the day. We're providing that safety net. And you, as the parent, are the safety net. You create that sense of peace and security in your child. So when you notice that they're going through a soul fever, the more that you can be there for them and provide that stability, uh, the faster that you will see them work through the soul fever. You might also focus on increasing those connection points during the day, as well as creating moments to release pressure. Um, You know, this is time such as nap time or maybe like a quiet time in their bedroom, read alouds, going on walks, or even physical activity is a great release for children. So that might mean, you know, rolling around on the rug, wrestling, jumping up and down, Um, playing in the backyard. And it depends, like it depends on what symptoms your child is having. If they're feeling lethargic, movement may not be the answer for them. You know, then it might mean cuddling or reading a great book or even working quietly on Legos, whatever it is that revives and restores your child. You may also consider taking them out in nature, uh, letting them dig bare feet in the dirt or sit in a tree. Both of these can be so incredibly therapeutic. This might also look like heading somewhere with more wild nature, but really any space with some green and trees will do. Ask yourself what activities bring your child to her most peaceful self and incorporate those. Perhaps it's doing nothing at all. 
And isn't that the truth that often what we need is just quiet and silence and nothingness? That can really truly be the antidote to the busy lives that we often tend to live. Another method to consider over the long term is simplifying your home and particularly your child's space. If you think of your child's capacity for stimulation to be like an empty cup at the beginning of the day, but your home environment automatically drops a couple of large rocks in the glass at the very start of the day, um, their capacity for stimulation is going to be much, much less. And the reason is that clutter and just visual items in general are are so distracting to the child. Um, they're overstimulating and that in itself can cause some soul fever. So by simplifying their bedroom to just the basics of what they need, it creates a sanctuary for them at home. I personally love increasing those special moments between myself and my child whenever I notice a soul fever. So this means I might spend more time lovingly cooking a special breakfast, cuddling and reading books with them on the couch, or even just running them a bath with you know, like lavender essential oil and and dimming the lights, maybe lighting a little beeswax candle and just sitting with them and talking, hearing what is on their heart. Similarly to when they're actually sick, I pull out all of my intentional mom tricks out of the bag and just really shower them with love and support. And, you know, it's not that we aren't doing this all of the time, but rather it's just being so intentional about connecting with their heart and trying to be a resource and a listening ear to see what is really going on. Why is my child in this funk? And that can really be the answer to what they're experiencing. Finally, be aware if any of your adult conversations, worries, and stresses might be impacting your little one. Our children are so intuitive of our moods, and even though we may think that we're keeping it under wraps, they're really aware. Children thrive on a sense of predictability and security, so see in what ways you can shore up that feeling for them and create consistency at home. I wanted to share a few examples of what soul fever has looked like with my children, and hopefully these offer you a visual of what it looks like in real life. When my six-year-old daughter was heading off to preschool for the first time at age three, We went through a really hard bout of soul fever. She wasn't ready to spend a half day away from me. She was frightened when I left her at school, and even though it was a wonderful and loving environment, it was not working out. I noticed a few things in her almost immediately. She wasn't sleeping well at night and was consistently having nightmares. Then the nightmares began turning into night terrors. She was emotionally volatile, crying often, and just so clingy. It just broke my heart. Her appetite dropped and my normally sunshiny and happy little girl was sad and truly struggling. It got to the point that even the day she wasn't in school, she was still having emotional breakdowns. We persisted for about a month thinking that she just needed to work through the transition. But my intuition was telling me that the change to preschool was just not right for her at the time. And even though other parents told me that my daughter just needed to get used to it, I pulled her out and it was, it was really such a hard decision. And yet I could see that my daughter was just really struggling and what she needed most was to be at home with me. I added in lots of cuddling and reading books and imaginative play, quiet time to reorient her back to our home rhythm, as well as spending lots of time outdoors. And this did the trick to help my little girl get back to her old self. Now let me share a more serious case of soul fever that we realized actually is much bigger than soul fever, but is anxiety that has developed in one of my children. We're still working through this, but I feel like it's so important to share these experiences with you so that you know, I don't have a perfect family life or home, but I deal with really hard stuff too. When we stopped traveling full-time in our RV, we stayed in it for a few months until we found our rental home. We absolutely love our rental home, and for the most part, we feel totally settled and content with where we are. However, soon after moving into our rental house in March of 2019, one of my children developed fairly severe anxiety. 
there are certain situations that we know are triggering for her, but for the most part, this is completely out of left field and it's consistently every day. The anxiety has impacted our family tremendously. And I bring this story up as a case of what seemed like soul fever, but actually we needed professional help. Last summer, it got so bad that every day was a struggle. Now, I don't want to share really specific details because I, I want to protect my child's privacy and that this is being her story. But I will say this. Nobody was happy and nobody was sleeping well and behavior was getting worse all around, including mine, because I wasn't sure how to deal with this sudden change in my child. It was so worrying to me that my beautiful, brave, and happy girl could be so scared all the time. To see such a huge change in her was incredibly hard. We worked with a counselor over the summer that helped marginally and then also had our child do a program for children called Turnaround Anxiety. And this was helpful because it gave her the vocabulary to understand what was going on. And then last September, we took our child to see her doctor and to maybe get some more answers. Our doctor is a naturopath and an MD, which is amazing and so helpful. And she definitely had some answers. Now, she mentioned multiple things, including checking for mold and other environmental pollutants, sensitivity to electromagnetic frequencies, and even allergies. These were all things that were so not on my radar that I hadn't even really thought about. And so for us to open up the discussion to all of this is is really important. And so that's kind of why I wanted to share this is that if you are in an answer seeking stage, it is so helpful to connect with a professional that can help help you see the big picture. Our doctor suggested that we even move back in our travel trailer for a week or more and see how our child does in that environment, since that was the last place that she felt good. We haven't done this yet, but we're planning to over spring break when I don't have to take the girls to school during the week. Since the anxiety also correlated with some other issues we were seeing last fall, our doctor suggested it could also possibly be a childhood condition called PANS or PANDA. PANS is Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, and PANDA is the strep throat-induced version. Apparently, more and more children are being diagnosed with it, which is just, it's very sad, and it makes you wonder why. Like, why is this happening? And so I think it's really worthwhile to be knowledgeable about the symptoms in case, you know, one of your children or someone that you know is suffering, that it's it's quickly identified because that's really key in the treatment. We don't know 100% if that's what this is or really what the problem is, which is hard as a mama. I want to know, and I don't. Um, There are some pretty pricey tests that we could do to figure all of this out, but right now the doctor has actually all of our children on a very specific supplement regimen and on the autoimmune protocol diet. And that is supposed to take care of a whole host of potential issues. We are in no way out of the woods, but I am just so grateful to be slowly finding answers. Now, why am I sharing all of this? To be truthful, even though I Instagram and I podcast and I do all these things, I really am hesitant to share about my children because I want to honor their privacy as much as possible. 2019 was such a hard year for us. We really struggled to find answers and to help our child. And so if my experience can help you feel less alone, then it is worthwhile for me to share. Whether you've experienced soul fever with all of your kiddos or this is the first time you've heard of it, please know that you are the perfect parent to help them through it. Just like a regular fever, offer that care and love slow life down and protect their need for rest and quiet. And above all, follow your intuition on what to do next. Seek professional help when it seems bigger than a temporary bout of soul fever and just know that you're not alone. I'll put more information about everything I mentioned in the show notes and please share this with a friend who needs to hear this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I am sending hugs and just all the appreciation your way. And I will see you next time.